Welcome to this Education and Philosophy podcast, part of a series introducing key ideas in education and philosophy. The ideas covered in this series are discussed in relation to their potential use to present-day thought and practice. This series draws from the book Education and Philosophy, published by SAGE, to which there is a link below. This podcast will offer an outline critique of liberal humanism. Liberal humanism descends from Renaissance humanism, but should nonetheless be carefully distinguished from it. It represents the transformation of that earlier humanism during a period of intellectual, social and economic upheaval that stretched from the late 16th to the 19th century. A range of factors have been connected to this idealist variant of humanism. It has been described as the self-serving, self-justifying ideology of the bourgeoisie, the property-owning, wealthy class that emerged with the expansion of capitalism through the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. Some have seen the disempowerment of monarchies, in particular England's execution of its king in 1649 as a crucial event in which identities formed in subjection to a sovereign, identity subsumed within the monarch's identity, were freed up. This opened the way for the individual to understand him or herself as the author of his or her own history. A parallel and surely more decisive switch resulted from the great scientific and technological advances of the age, of the so-called scientific and industrial revolutions, which seemed to hold out the possibility that man was in control of his destiny, and we are generally still speaking here of men to the exclusion of all others. According to this mode of thought, man no longer occupied a universe in which his fate was entirely in the hands of a supernatural being, nor need he be entirely powerless before the assaults of nature. The philosophies of Descartes and Locke proposed the figure of the knowing self-possessed individual, and the great idealist philosophical systems such as those of Kant and Hegel, affirmed man's capacity to take hold of and shape his being. These latter two, it is worth noting, were philosophies that, in contrast to medieval and Renaissance humanism, had, with occasional exceptions, little to say about how education or, indeed, the moral life of societies should be organised. They were what have been called university philosophies, and they rarely dipped a toe into the murky waters of everyday life. Liberal humanism clearly differed from its predecessor, Renaissance humanism, in all of the respects outlined above. The most profound difference between the two humanisms was with regard to their respective positions on the sovereignty of the human subject. Liberal humanism asserts this sovereignty in a way that differs radically from Renaissance humanist conceptions. A more assertive, liberal humanist definition of human sovereignty took hold and became dominant. Humanism continues to have a pervasive influence. Scientific inquiry, when it accounts for itself in the public arena, almost invariably adopts a language that is humanistic, a language that speaks of progress, of the advance of humanity's knowledge of itself and the universe, and of man's successes in overcoming or ameliorating many of the effects of the adversities, disease, natural disaster, famine, that have besieged it throughout history. The common sense of our age, at least in so-called developed countries like the United Kingdom, has tended to assume that humanity is embarked upon a journey of betterment, of meaningful progress towards a future in which suffering, pain and cruelty are either eliminated or exceptional. And of course, one of the most vocal expressions of progressive thought describes itself as humanist. This is the secular humanism that finds a militant form in the British Humanist Society, which defines humanists as people who discount religious explanations of man's existence, who believe that the scientific method offers the only route to an understanding of the universe and that the exercise in social and political life of reason and humane values can lead human beings to a happier and more rewarding existence. 
finally, with the United Nations adoption in 1948 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, world governance has enshrined human rights as the property of all human beings, the embodiment in law of the universal moral principles that define humanity. The principles of dignity, liberty, equality and brotherhood generate a profusion of documentation, some of it statutory, designed to guarantee fundamental human freedoms. However sceptical one might be of universal claims made on behalf of liberal humanism, it must be acknowledged, as Tony Davies has written in his book Humanism, that some variety of humanism remains, on many occasions, the only available alternative to bigotry and persecution. The freedom, he continues, to speak and write, to organise and campaign in defence of individual or collective interests, to protest and disobey, all the prospect of a world in which they will be secured can only be articulated in humanist terms. End quote. Humanism is, at present, an inescapable horizon that limits our notion of the possible. There are extensive critiques of what is involved here in relation to the consequences of taking man as the starting point of attempts to reach truth. But, as Martin Heidegger observed in his letter on humanism, anyone preparing to criticise humanism will worry that the reader or audience might think that the writer is going to argue for inhumanity, for barbarity and brutality. The word humanism is weighed down with a sense of the deepest and most precious values, and to oppose it as an idea may seem a destructive and malign act. Heidegger's argument, however, is that questioning the concept opens up other points of view, different ways of conceiving what the human is in its essence. Indeed, this is one of the suspicions that has been expressed about humanism, that far from defining the human in all its possibility, the term circumscribes, limits what it is possible to think and say about humanity. It works to narrow down what it means to be human. Existing humanisms could be described as imperial, as speaking in the accents and the interests of a class, a sex, a race. All humanisms assert the universality of their values, even though a consideration of each humanism in its historical materiality reveals that they work in the interests of a particular fragment of a society, of a world, and that they identify and exclude from full humanity others who, at various times and in various places, have included slaves, peasantries, women, those of a different religion or race, and the uneducated. Being human requires full compliance with a specific, strictly police system of thought and belief. To repeat, all humanisms are local, historically contingent, yet see themselves as embodying universal truths. All humanisms have others, often plural, who do not qualify as human and therefore fall outside the grace of God or the mercy of the civilised. It is worth pondering who the others of modern secular humanism might be. If this podcast seems to sanction a negative judgment of the humanisms that it has described, it is in part because a version of humanism has, since the early modern period, been the ethical resource by means of which Western civilization has justified its actions, its forms of government, and its often violent contacts with other cultures and civilizations. It is the enlightened face that it presents to the world, a face that claims a moral superiority. It invites critique precisely because it presents itself as a system of thought that is more purely rational and moral than any of the alternative ethical, philosophical or spiritual systems that exist in the world. And yet it has failed to restrain, has at times licensed acts of national and international cruelty, exploitation and conquest. Under the banner of humanist values, Western powers have freely engaged in acts of inhumanity towards their own populations and those of other nationalities. In this, it might be pointed out, it is no different from other dominant belief systems throughout history which have proclaimed a moral right to deal violence to those 
who have thought or believed differently. However, it is doubtful that any other dominant system of thought has been quite as ready to portray its imperial enterprises as philanthropic projects. Where earlier imperialisms invaded, plundered and slaughtered because it would bring glory or wealth to their nations, or because they wished to punish unruly populations, governments operating on a liberal humanist licence to invade, plunder and slaughter do so because they wish to bring civilization to benighted lands, because they wish to confer the benefits of freedom, justice and the light of reason, often in part via education, upon savage or benighted peoples. So to summarise, liberal humanism is the official value system of the so-called developed nations that still largely dominate global economics and politics, and it is the system of values which citizens of the liberal democracies are obliged to live by. These factors alone make it necessary that we call it to account and submit it to critique. However, although liberal humanism does not always work as well as it claims, to say the least, it would be foolish to ignore its achievements. Davies, quoted earlier, warns that it would be dangerous to abandon the ground occupied by it, since humanism often offers the only available defence against bigotry and persecution. Humanist values have been incorporated into law in many countries and the institutions that have been created to defend and promote the rights that humanism espouses, such as freedom of speech, equality before the law, freedom of expression, the freedom to associate with others, the right to political protest, are important and valuable achievements. It is also the case that humanism, in concert with capitalism, delivered European societies from the bondage of dogmatic religious thought and the tyrannies of feudal society and, as Marx and Engels put it, rescued whole segments of populations from, quote, the idiocy of rural life. Education has been a key instrument for transmitting the values and postulates of liberal humanism. This has been a role and responsibility that has not only been touched by the higher goals of humanism, but one that has also inherited its contradictions. These ideas are discussed in more detail in Chapter 5 of Education and Philosophy. If you would like to hear another podcast discussing a key idea related to education and philosophy, click below. Thank you for listening.